Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for attending this talk. Um, I'm going to, to talk uh, about the uh, BAD again. So this is a uh, Bluetooth low energy. And especially a new feature introduced in version 5, which is this uh, pure NG uh, for fun jamming, obviously. So, who am I? I'm a security evangelist at Digital Security, which is a French uh, IT security company with a focus on IoT. I'm also a senior, senior security researcher and the main developer and maintainer of BTD Jack, which is basically a Swiss Army knife for BAD. So, the main question is, what's new in BAD5? So this uh, version of uh, Bluetooth No Energy has been released in uh, 2016, but uh, in fact, this protocol is uh, much older. You know, it's, it has been introduced in 2010 at the, uh, the, with the name Bluetooth Smart. So, because, you know, it was smart, supposed to. Uh, in the Bluetooth core specification version 4.0, and uh, it has evolved since then, uh, yeah, this one, since then, version 4.1 in 2013, 4.2 in uh, 2014, and so on. And the latest version is version 5.1, and it was released this year, so you see, it's uh, evolving, and th that's great. This protocol includes some security mechanisms. Uh, first one is the pairing, which is a, um, a method to exchange keys with uh, various methods, uh, such as the pin code. So you can use a six-digit pin code to uh, set up uh, a shared key between two devices, uh, out-of-band data, and uh, also with the uh, Bluetooth 4.2 with elliptic curves. So yeah, that's great. We, this protocol pro provides a way to secure communications. You know, you can just enable encryption and authentication. So basically, when you're a developer, you can create secure connection between two devices with, uh, without any problem. And there is uh, another item in my list, which is called the channel selection algorithm. So basically, this is not a security feature. This is something used to improve coexistence. So it makes uh, your life easier, you know, when you are at a con, for instance, with a lot of people around you, with a lot of BLE devices enabled, so you can still communicate with the device. Uh, I will explain it later. But uh, this mechanism, this uh, channel sele selection algorithm, makes sniffing quite complicated because, uh, because of uh, how it works. There are some well-known attacks on BD, and especially on BD4, 4.x, uh, which are, uh, first one is sniffing, basically, so you can just sniff packets uh, in the air, and you can capture secrets if uh, they are sent uh, unencrypted over the air, so this is uh, quite straightforward. So when uh, a device doesn't use a secure connection, then you can get something valuable, uh, I've shown, I'd various conferences, some vulnerable padlocks and smart locks uh, that do the same and they can be defeated by sniffing. Another attack is jamming, so you can jam an existing connection uh, between two devices. So this is quite interesting because you can, if you want to, to hijack uh, some pairing mechanism, then you can disrupt the connection and sniff for the pairing process again. And the last one is uh, hijacking. So. By doing this attack, you can take over an existing connection between two devices and do whatever you want with a slave device. Uh, just say you got a, a smartwatch connected to your smartphone. I, I can hack into the connection, take uh, control of this connection and do whatever I want with your smartwatch. And your smartphone will be disconnected and could not, will not be able to reconnect again. So, uh, these three attacks were presented, uh, in, uh, the jamming and uh, hijacking, especially uh, last year. If you want to perform attacks on BLD, you will need some hardware. First one is the Ubertooth, uh, which is well known. The second one is a microbit uh, from uh, sponsored by the BBC. So this is a tiny device originally designed to teach UK students how to code. So yeah, so uh, quite interesting. Cluster bag around 12 or 15 euros, so if you want to, to buy it, it's very affordable. And the last one is the TI, Texas Instrument Development Board, so it costs uh, much more, but uh, it's uh, more powerful. 
Uh, as I mentioned before, I developed BTLE Jack, which is basically a Susami knife for performing, you know, many at attacks on BLE devices. And this tool is compatible with the microbit I showed you before. And also, all the boards based on the same chip, which is the Nordic semiconductor chip, the NRF51822. But yeah, so we got a lot of hardware to, to deal with uh, these uh, BLE devices. So, what about the BLD5? The new version of BLD, BLD5, uh, provides some improvements. You know, you get a better throughput. You can exchange data more with, more, yeah, uh, in less time than before because the speed goes up to two megabit per second. You get a better range. Uh, with this version of BLD, you can communicate with the device up to 240 meters away. Normally with BLD4, it's about maybe 10 to up to 20 meters. So this is quite interesting. And they also improve the coexistence. So you can get more devices in the same place, in the same room, without uh, having uh, or experiencing a lot of collisions and dis uh, connection disruptions. So again, something very cool. So to achieve the better throughput, the better range, uh, Goals. Uh, the Bluetooth Low Energy Protocol adds two new files. So a file is just a physical layer, uh, you know, allowing uh, the devices to exchange packets. The first one, uh, the first file that has been introduced is a two megabit per second encoded file. So this is, it's basically the same file layer as BLE4, but with a, a speed uh, uh, that has been doubled. So it's twice the speed of BLE4. And the other file introduced is the LE coded file, which is used to uh, increase the range of this uh, protocol. So if you uh, send data at at uh, 125 kilobit per second with this coded file, you know, the range is, uh, uh, is uh, four times the normal BLE range, and is twice the, uh, the BLE range when you are sending data uh, uh, you know, m m some, some, somehow more faster with uh, 500 kilobit per second. So, if you have a look at the datagram, which is the, basically the, what uh, the packets look like with these uh, different files, uh, on the top uh, of this slide, you can find the uncoded file, the, uh, the new file, so it's very complex. If you want to, to be able to, to sniff or to do whatever you want, uh, yeah, it's not really possible. It takes more time to, to develop this. But if you have a look at the bottom of this side, this is the uh, leg um, legacy file used. And as you can see, you get quite some identical parameters. First one is the access address. So this is a, a four byte value, a 32 bits value that identify a link between two devices. So this value is important for the the rest of my talk, so just keep that in mind. Uh, when you create a connection between two devices, the connection is identified by this value, which is, uh, which is the access address. To improve coexistence, they developed a new channel selection algorithm. So basically, BLE implements uh, FHSS, which is the, uh, some kind of uh, frequency hopping uh, mechanism. Um, that means when you create a connection between two devices, both devices are going to synchronize and then hop to uh, different frequencies based on the specific algorithm. So this algorithm, this is the channel selection algorithm. And in BLE4, they introduced the first channel selection algorithm, which is uh, the one based on the addition and with the mod 37. But in BD5, they decided to, to make it more random, you know, by um, just introducing a new pure NG. And they are using this pure NG to yeah, maximize the capacity of uh, devices you can have in the uh, same room. Uh, and they, um, they were expecting that this uh, pure NG makes life easier, you know, and makes connection, connections, BD connections more reliable. So, we got this new channel selection algorithm, and uh, this is interesting because in terms of security, when it comes to security analysis, it makes our life um, not easier, um, more complex, you know, because it uses a totally different pattern, hopping pattern. So basically, if you are, if you are used to the first channel selection algorithm, 
the uh, hopping pattern is based on the 37 different channels. So it's basically a, a simple sequence of 37 channels and uh, the, um, the device loops over the sequence again and again. So once you get the sequence, then, then you know how to synchronize and to how to sniff packets from the air. But with this new PRNG, this is a 65,536 uh, different hubs that are generated with this algorithm. So it's, it's more complicated to, to get this sequence. Sniffing new connection is still possible because when a connection is initiated, you get everything you need to synchronize. You get all the required parameters to decide how to generate this sequence and help, uh, with the, along with the, both the devices you are, you want to sniff. So, what about jamming and hijacking? If you want to jam uh, a BAD connection, you need to synchronize with this, uh, this system. But the firmware I developed for BTD Jack was developed for BTD, BAD4, not 5. So at this time, it wasn't possible to jam an existing BAD5 connection. And of course, it was uh, also impossible to hi hijack uh, a BAD5 device. They added in BD5 also uh, two new files, so we need some kind of new hardware to to be able to to use this uh, new uh, speeds and uh, this new range feature that has been introduced in BD5. So that means my BTD jack tool and the microbit may be limited to sniff BD5 connections. So that's a big question: Are BD attacks dead? Are we going to be able to, again, jam and hijack BAD5 connections? Well, first, let's have a look at this uh, BAD5 PRNG stuff. And this is very interesting because, you know, a colleague of mine challenged me on this, on, on this PRNG. And he said to me, yeah, uh, there is, uh, there is this PRNG stuff uh, or thing. Uh, you, you should have a look at it. It looks very awkward. Yeah, why not? So, um, this pure NGG, uh basically uses um, two different values. The first one is what uh, the specifications call the channel identifier. So the channel identifier is just a, a value used as a seed to this uh, random number generator. This PRNG also relies on basic operations, so just some additions, multiplications, XOR, and some bit permutations also. And there was also some something called the channel remapping, but I, I won't go into details in this uh, in this process. But this is something that is also used, and it may have some impact if you want to attack this uh, PRNG. Channel identifier, it's computed from the access address. So remember, this is the 32 bit value that, uh, had an, um, that identifies a connection between two devices. So this is a 16 bit value and this is computed based on the, um, on the formula, uh, put on this slide. So you basically take bits to 0 to 15 and you XOR with the bits from th uh, 16 to 31 and that's it. Well, why not? Then it uses some kind of uh, mathematical um, routine, which is uh, called MAM for multiply add mod. And it uses this, uh, this routine t uh, th uh, three times in this, uh, in the computation. So this is the uh, random number generator overview. So first, you take a, a counter, which is basically a value that, has, uh, that will be incremented uh, over time, and a 16-bit channel identifier. You apply XOR, bit permutations, first MAM, bit permutations, second MAM, and so on. And the output is your random number. So yeah. If you have a look at the specs, again, you get an overview of this uh, uh, this uh, channel selection algorithm. And basically, if uh, there is no remapping at all, ch no channel remapping, then you take this random number, your mod with, uh, you compute the mod 37, and then you get your channel. Well, that's pretty awesome. But uh, I have to admit, when I saw this in the specs, I was more like, uh, you know, <laughs> what the hell? 
Yeah, and I wasn't alone. Uh, on Twitter, uh, Matthew Green also tweeted something about the specs, saying basically that every page should be legal. Yeah, I agree. So, first rule of cryptography is don't roll your own. Your own. This, uh, when you are designing a new PRNG or when you want to use a, a PRNG in a specs, yeah, creating your own is not really uh, the best idea you can have. So, let's break this PNG. Uh, there are some flaws in this uh, algorithm. First, the channel identifier, which is a 16-bit value. Th this value is computed from th uh, the access address, which is basically public when a device advertises itself <laughs> with the BAD protocol. This access address is known. So, this is something we can get from the, the um, BAD communication. And then we can obviously deduce this channel identifier. The next value uh, is generated from a counter, not from some kind of internal state. So this is not a, a best practice. Um, but in fact, this is the case for this PRNG. So it may be interesting to see what we can deduce from this uh, behavior. And if you look at the big picture, um, this is is it really a PRNG? Because it's uh, just a function, some kind of mathematical function that takes an input, a channel ident identifier, so it's something we know, and a counter, and it basically uh, generates uh, 65,000 ish uh, sequence values. So, channel identifier is constant, and it generates, uh, this function generates uh, 65,000 value sequence. So, basically, this is, uh, well, this can be. Uh, Understood that as random, but that's not that much random. So, how to break it? First, we consider channel identifier as known, you know, because the access address is known, so this one is known. And we are left with an unknown 60 min counter. So, the, our, our goal, if you want to break, uh, this, uh, this, um, protocol or this, uh, PRNG is to guess what is this, what this counter is. So, if we can figure out where we are in the sequence of these uh, 65,000 values generated using this uh, method, then we would find our, our, our counter, because our counter is the index in this sequence. So, first step, guessing this value, this counter. As an attacker, we don't have so much information about these uh, internal states or this counter. So the only thing we can do is to monitor uh, an ongoing BAD connection, and we can, one, determine when a packet is sent over a specific channel, and two, we can determine the time span between two packets we, we, we got on two different channels. So this is uh, our input uh, for, from an attacker perspective. The prerequisite for this is to know uh, the open interval value. I will go... I will explain later what uh, this value is. But my first approach was to use a sieve. You know, when you are looking for prime numbers, this is uh, 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 this type of algorithm that you can use. Uh, so the, the, the main idea be, uh, behind this sieve is to uh, eliminate every possible candidate in the smallest number, number of rounds. So you are going to, to perform a loop, and at, during each loop, you are going to eliminate one or more candidates. And normally, you would be, there will be only one candidate left, and this is the value you're, you are, you are looking for. So, let's do it. Considering a counter value of zero, so this is the, our supposed value for this counter, we compute channel C0 based on the PRNG uh, computations uh, I showed you before, with this candidate counter, and we wait. We we'll just sit on the channel and wait for a packet. So we're going to, to get the packet at T0. Then we do the same with the next packet, so with the counter uh, uh, incremented of by one, so C1, and we get another packet at T1. So we compute the time difference between the, these two packets, and if you know exactly how long uh, a device stays on each channel, you can even deduce the number of hops that have been uh, needed to go from channel zero to channel one. By knowing this, you get some valuable information. Then we are going to look uh, to look in the sequence in the 65,000 uh, channel sequence. We are going to look at 
these two channels separated by this exact number of hops. And once you get this, you get uh, multiple candidates because, you know, uh, channels are not used once, but um, a lot more times. So we get uh, around 200 and 400 candidates for the first round, basically. And we do it again with this uh, 200 and 400 candidates. So we compute C1, C0 and C1. We write packet on C0, write another packet on C1, we compute the number of hops, and we save again our list of candidates. So we, ta we take our reduced list and we eliminate more candidates until we, we get only one candidate. So this single candidate that we are left for with is the value of this counter at T0 when we started this attack. So you have to keep track of the number of ops you made bit, um, uh, after T0 to compute the exact value used now by this uh, PONG. So I got a small video showing you the implementation of this attack. So I wrote everything in Python before, you know, testing this uh, this attack in, uh, on live uh, devices. So here we go. This is a, a simple Python script simulating the protocol and the communication between two devices. The so counter is uh, 13,600 13, at the start. We are going to loop over every possible candidate. So after the, the second round, we get 21 candidates, six, three, two, and we are left with a single candidate. And if you have a look at this value, this is exactly the value we are looking for, which is the value of the counter when we started the attack. So in theory, this attack works. So that's great. Let's move on. Second step is to get the hop interval. The hop interval is basically the time spent by your device on each channel. And we need this value because it's required to perform the, you know, the counter guessing attack. And basically, if you monitor the time spent between a lot of different channels, and this is what we did, uh, during the first attack, you can compute the GCD of all of these values, and obviously the hop interval is a multiple of the uh, uh, these values. Sorry, a multiple of this hop interval. So by computing the GCD, you will end up with this hop interval value. Again, I simulated this with a, a, a script. And uh, I ended up with this uh, small chart. I made a lot of tests with this uh, GCD computation. And as you can see, if you, if you compute five uh, deltas, uh, five time differences, then you get a success rate of approximately 95% uh, when you are trying to guess this hop interval value. And the maximum time required is about two minutes. With 10, 10 meters, it goes to up to three minutes with a 100% success, success weight. So this is quite interesting. But the fact is that um, it would take more time to have a reliable value for this op interval. So if you are going to attack an, uh, an actual device, then you will need up to two or three minutes to get this value. So you need to be close to your target between two or three minutes. So this was only theory. With all of this, I was theoretically able to, you know, to sniff a BAD5 connection and to break this PONG. So uh, I decided to test it on a, on a real devices. So I go uh, on Amazon looking for BAD5 devices. And yeah, <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> there were no BAD5 devices out there. So. Uh, I was uh, still motivated. I decided to create my own. So I bought two development kits for Nodex semiconductors and I implement uh, some kind of uh, client server uh, program. So on one development kit, uh, I put some uh, slave code and on the other one, uh, master code. And then uh, I got a BAD working BAD5 connection using this new channel selection algorithm. And I also took my firmware from BTD Jack and used this to, to improve this uh, sniffing process. So I started implementing a new firmware uh, 
with uh, some limitations because as I said before, BTLD Jack is based on a microbit and this microbit is not compatible with, uh, with the new files. So, um, for the one megabit per second uncoded file, it works. I, I was able to sniff BLD packets. So, I modify uh, BTLD Jack to be able to, to get the uh, hop interval value. So basically, uh, using this GCD approach, it works pretty well. So yeah, I won't demonstrate here this this uh, this kind of attack. But anyway, uh, and I started implementing my new sieve attack on this uh, PRNG counter. So I implemented it. First one went pretty well. You know, I got some uh, about 250 candidates. So yeah, that's good. And the next rounds we are totally crap. <laughs> Um, I, I got no candidates after the second round. So there were some, uh, some issues with my, with my code. Uh, I wasn't able to guess the counter. So, uh, it seems like filtering out candidates took a hell of a time on this tiny device. Uh, and this was inducing some kind of delay and I got this, uh, desynchronized from the existing connection. So this was, uh, some kind of, uh, an issue. I also, tried a lot of sorting algorithm, a like quick sort and so on, just to, to try to speed up the process, but in fact, this uh, sorting algorithm did not help. So yeah, I was a bit sad at this time. So I decided to redesign my sieve attack. I modified my approach. So uh, instead of uh, filtering a, v uh, a list of candidates, I decided to generate some kind of pattern and look, this, look at this pattern in my, uh, uh, in my sequence. So. This code now takes uh, some measures first, and with these measures, with 10 values, for instance, we can deduce the hop interval, and you can also l create some kind of pattern you, are, you will be able to look for in the sequence to get the correct uh, PRNG counter at the time you, are, you started the attack. And this worked pretty well, hopefully. And I started implementing the, this old stuff, you know, sniffing the connection. So basically, you need the hop interval, so this one worked. We need the uh, pure NG counter, this one also worked. And then you need to synchronize with the connection to be able to hop at the uh, exact same time than the devices that, uh, do. So uh, this um, didn't work because uh, I was stuck. Uh, I got everything I needed and uh, I was not able to Synchronize with these devices. And I looked again at, uh, at my code and I, I found this tiny loop, you know, it loops over uh, every possible candidate. And this was the uh, one of the first version of my, uh, um, hoping uh, pattern detection. And it looks like this piece of code takes 13 ops to complete. So when I, I finished getting the PRNG counter, I was 13 hopes behind the actual devices. So no way I could guess or I could synchronize uh, with these devices. So I made some, some fix in my code and I got something working for sniffing. I'll show you in a minute. So this is a, a sniffing I made uh, on the device. Just to show you that, uh, yeah, it's possible to capture values. So you will also see the speed of this attack. So um, the PRNG internal counter recovery process started. It will take some some seconds to get the uh, PRNG counter value. Um, yeah, you'll have to wait a bit. But anyway, uh, during this time, there is this all these measures that are made, and then. Uh, uh, this uh, firmware uses this use these measures to to deduce the value. So here we got a counter value of three thousand and seven hundred fifty, and we get synchronized. We got packets, so we are able to sniff uh, an actual BAD connection, BAD five connection using this new uh, PRNG stuff. So that's great. How about jamming? Um, it's possible to jam this uh, this device once when, once you are synchronized, because we are going to abuse some kind of timeout to perform this jamming. 
And this is already implemented in uh, BTD Jack. So I, I tried to, uh, to jam a device with, uh, uh, you know, you know, this uh, new, uh, synchronization stuff I, I developed. And uh, it worked quite, pretty well. So. Here is one of my, yeah, maybe the worst demo I made for uh, a talk. <laughs> you know, because we, we, I don't have any BAD5 real devices, you know, could have been interesting to, to hack into a drone or a quadcopter or maybe a sex toy too. But there are no, no devices uh, on the market yet. So I created my own code, uh, and, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a shame, but anyway. Uh, on the, uh, bottom of the slide, you get the development board, and with a tiny LED, you know, that is it. So this is the way we are going to detect that the jamming has been uh, successful. And uh, I started, so sniffing the, synchronizing with this connection, and uh, starting the jamming process. Uh, is it really playing? Okay, so, it's on. So again, we are going to recover the uh, PONG internet counter. So it takes some seconds. Once we get the counter, then we are going to jam the connection. So basically, the, this uh, uh, BLD jamming is performed by sending some packets to uh, to jam the answers from the slave to the master. In a way, the master will consider the connection lost before the slave. And by doing this, we disrupt an existing connection. The only prerequisite is to be able to, to synchronize with the device. So here, the, there are some LED states changed. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this, but uh, yeah, the, there is the, uh, the, the LED on the top that indicates that the device has been disconnected. And it still waits for connection. So once it, uh, the master device got disconnected, it tries to connect again. So this is why the LED goes, uh, goes down again. So, so this jamming, uh, jamming works pretty well. Uh, it has been implemented in BTLD Jack version 2. And this is available on GitHub. So if you want to give it a try with a BLD5 device, if you got one, or if you're implementing one, or I don't know, uh, this could be interesting to see uh, if this tool works. I hope it uh, it does. But uh, let's have a look at the, the takeaways of the of this talk. So as a conclusion, uh, we can say that this new PRNG introduced in BD5 uh, is weak from a security perspective because it's not really a PRNG. Uh, basically, it's called PRNG in the specs, but in fact. It, just, it's just a generator for some kind of uh, uh, channel sequence used to, to hop for these uh, two devices. Uh, 16 bits out of 32 can be easily guessed from some kind of public value, which is the access address. And the last 16 bits compose a counter that is periodically incremented. So this is uh, one of the issues here. If uh, it was an internal state modifying itself, it I, I, I wouldn't have been able to, to, to hack into this pure NG. Um, you have to keep in mind that this PRNG has been designed to improve coexistence. At, uh, the, the Bluetooth SIG, uh, we developed the, the, um, the specifications, did not uh, tell people that they are going to, to improve security by using this, uh, this algorithm. So the, it is not a goal to uh, achieve security with this with this uh, PNG, so they are going. They are not gonna. Uh, they are not going to fix this uh, this algorithm. And it has also been designed to be easily implemented in low power devices. You know, you're, when you get this uh, IoT device, it's uh, uh, based on a very low power CPU with a. You cannot do a lot of computations, so. In a way, it was a, it was a clever move from the Bluetooth stake to improve coexistence. And of course, the only drawback we may have encounter uh, uh, as an attacker is that we weren't able to sniff, or we will not be able to, to sniff BAD5 connection because of this new algorithm. But in fact, it's not a, a security a mechanism. For the future, we should use uh, an, another chip made by Nordic Semiconductor, which is the Honor 52840, that supports this uh, new files. 
Uh, I still got a lot of work to port BTL Jack to this platform because, you know, it's a new platform. It's a new, uh, this is a new uh, SOC. So it's uh, a lot of work to, to make it work with the new platform. But luckily, Marcus Manx, uh, this is, um, the guy who developed uh, all of these, all these news atta uh, new attacks, sorry, on, uh, Logitech, mice and keyboards. And, and this guy has already done a great job with this uh, NOF 52840, and uh, there are some code available on the internet on GitHub that can be reused for this project. So maybe uh, I will be able to 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 improve this uh, this tool and make it work with the new files. Anyway. Everything I, I developed and I showed you during this talk for this BAD5 research uh, is on GitHub too. So if you want to give it a try, uh, get the Python scripts, um, tweak them, test uh, some, some new stuff, then go on. I also added some uh, implementation, C implementation of this PRNG for some diode or test scripts. Uh, the results are not that good, but uh, in fact, it's, uh, this PRNG is, has not been designed to be a, a real PRNG. So, anyway. And um, that's it. If you have some questions, it's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, as, as he said, if you've got some questions, it's up to you. Any, any questions? we got uh, some time. Hi, great, great, great stuff. Thanks. Um, I'm really a Bluetooth noob, so I might be asking stupid questions. Um, when, once you get past the pairing phase, uh, I, I hope their Bluetooth does some encryption stuff. So, of course, you can still jam and things, but you can really hijack a Bluetooth connection past the pairing phase. Uh, the Bluetooth protocol provides uh, encryption and authentication, so this jamming attack and hijacking um, uh, won't work with the uh, secure connection, BAD secure connection, because uh, we we, sh we won't be able to, to get the content of the packets. And the fact is that uh, there is another mechanism in BAD that is uh, quietly used, uh, used uh, nowadays, uh, which is the channel map uh, updates. Uh, that means a device may decide at uh, a specific time that uh, some channels are, no, uh, are too noisy or too, too um, yeah, uh, so some, some too many there are too many collisions on the channel. So uh, this device can tell the slave device that not to use some channels, and this is performed this way, and it changes radically the way the open mechanism works, you know, and especially the sequence we are trying to recover. So if at a specific time this channel maps is updated uh, and if it's done uh, un the, with encryption, we won't be able to catch this packet and we will be lost very quickly. So you may be able to intercept one or maybe, uh, uh, let's say, five packets and, uh, until this uh, channel map updates uh, is sent, and then it's uh, it's done. You, you won't be able to sniff whatever goes over the connections. And in fact, it's encrypted also. So even if you cut, uh, if you manage to get packets, you won't be able to to tell what's inside. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Okay, well, thanks, uh, Damien.